the next uh, one that I'm going to talk about is basically using isobaric tags uh, for relative and absolute quantification. The term uh, you will hear uh, or see in many papers is called ITRAC. It's basically abbreviation of uh, isobaric tags for relative and abs absolute quantification. Here the idea is basically to have an isobaric, the same mass, isobaric tags and label peptides derived from different treatments. However, these tags are uh, labeled in such a way in the linker group, there will be increasing of mass in this way and reduction in uh, mass in the reporter group. So what does it mean is when you label the amino terminus with this particular linker, having 28 and 117 combination, 29 and 116 combination, 30 and 115 combination, and 31 and 114 combination, they will have the same mass added to each, uh, to each of these samples. And when you mix them together, the peptide responsible for this mass addition will elute at the same time uh, of the liquid chromatographic column. So, when we do bottom-up mass spectrometry, doing the data-dependent mass spectrometry, we will isolate all the peptides that are coming from all these samples at the same time and do the fragmentation to get the identity. And the way this is designed is during the uh, uh, collision dissociation, uh, the more labile uh, uh, group over here will be fragmented to give report ion groups to basically signify the intensity of the peptide that is coming from each of these different treatments. Uh, so this uh, clever idea basically uh, lets you compare up to eight samples currently, a very similar uh, link uh, called tender mass tags, it's called TMT, currently lets you do the exact same experiment uh, uh, and compare up to 16 different samples. And I would like to pause at this point if uh, anybody has questions on this methodology, uh, because it's a very uh, popular uh, uh, method currently uh, in, in, in the field. So um, uh, many of you will come across uh, this technology. And if you have any questions, I would like to uh, take a moment to answer. Yeah, and something that um, Aruna didn't mention, but I'll mention is that this is, a, this is one of our, our most common quantitative approaches right now that we're using in the proteomics score. And then also in my research laboratory. So this is something that we're using quite a lot because it's very robust. So uh, if you uh, uh, re uh, recall the slide when I explained the, uh, uh, the label free approach, you can analyze all these samples separately. But one of the uh, primary reasons why we mix all these things together is that we don't have to repeat the LC, MS, MS experiments multiple times. So there are several things that is advantageous in using this approach. One thing is the reproducibility of uh, LC, MS, MS uh, experiments, which typically runs for, uh, if, you, if you think uh, just uh, simply, very simply, a three uh, hour gradient can be, uh, uh, Three, uh, if you have eight fractions, this is the orthogonal separation I was talking about. Three into uh, three hours into eight fractions gives you about 24 uh, uh, hours of MS analysis. So if you think of here, you have one, two, three, six times. So 24 into six is the time that is used to, uh, uh, it's a lot of instrument time that you have to do uh, this kind of an experiment. But if you mix everything together, 24 into six hours basically can be done in just 24 hours by mixing everything together. So it minimizes the uh, time. And most importantly, quantification standpoint, the variability if you do label free approach is much higher compared to the, uh, the multiplex approach uh, where uh, when there is much higher variability, subtle changes in quantification might not be visualized. Uh, in label free approaches. Uh, but here that uh, those subtle changes can be actually monitored very, uh, very cleanly uh, because everything will be analyzed at the, during the same LCMSMS analysis.
similar to mixing and multiplexing in a flow cell by high throughput sequencing. Mm -hmm. So that's good to think of this as kind of an analogy. Mm -hmm. And so it is similar to that, but there is uh, one key difference um, is that we actually can, um, in using these multiplex reagents, since they all weigh exactly the same, so, so Aruna taught, called them um, that they're isobaric, they have the same weight. And the reason that that is, is because the isotopes um, are, see if you can move on your screen. I don't know if everybody can see it, but if you can, if you say, uh, so the, the carbons in that ring and the nitrogen, all of these will sometimes have isotopes, so that, uh, just a plus one Dalton isotope. Um, and then the, the balancer, the linker groups, you put other isotopes there so that everything has exactly the same mass. And so unlike on a, on a, um, a sequencing that you do in high throughput sequencing, if you want to go back to the TMT slide, Aruna, yeah. um, um, in this case, everything has the same mass. And so it's analyzed all together as one big group. And so the only part where you can really get the different identity comes to when you break this into pieces. And so you either break it in an MS to the second experiment, um, which is what's shown on this slide and the spectra down below, or you can do it in an MS third experiment, which I don't think that Aruna is probably going to go into that detail. Uh, but we, we can uh, basically identify it then at that point. And it gives you an advantage because in the identity of the peptide sequence, um, you actually get a gain in signal to noise. And so when you have something that's present in all the samples, which might be important for whatever biological question that you're answering, it allows us to boost the signal to noise so that you get very clean data on that side in addition to the quantitation. Here, I just kind of have a semi-generic uh, proteomics workflow that includes TMT labeling with the goal of, your goal of quantitating peptides and proteins across multiple samples. Um, that would be different conditions and different biological replicates in one mass spectrometry run. And so uh, throughout the lecture, I'll just kind of hone in on some more details of some of the specific steps I've labeled in the workflow. Um, at least for me, sometimes it helps to kind of see how an actual full experiment would be laid out start to finish. Uh, so that's what I'm going to go over. Okay, so to focus on steps one and two that I've kind of labeled as extracting protein and digesting. So here we kind of have, just for a uh, cartoon reference, uh, three control biological replicates, and here labeled as treatment. These could be drug treatment, these could be mutant um, cell lines, or say you've CRISPRed a cell line and you want to know what this difference is doing to a whole proteome, um, whatever settings would be relevant to your experiments, uh, just sub those in here. And so one common method, so if you would like to look at the whole proteome, see whatever effect your perturbation is having, you need to extract the protein from mass spectrometry. One common way to do that is lysing your cells in eight molar urea. Eight molar urea will denature just about everything in the proteome. And so that way um, you can directly digest that. Um, other common options, something I do is say you have a perturbation, you're not as interested in the effect on the whole global proteome, but maybe a specific protein complex. You can also affinity purify or you know precipitate uh, your protein complex of interest and look more directly at that. So you have your extracted protein. Next, you need to digest it. Um, I think Dr. Dowd mentioned using trypsin in her lecture. Trypsin is kind of the standard used in the field. And it cleaves after lysines and arginines. Um, another common protease uh, can be used is lysine. You might gather from the name, cleaves after lysines. Uh, and there are other proteases that are options. Uh, say you are really interested in looking at um, lysine uh, modifications, maybe using a protease that cleaves after lysines wouldn't work as well for your experiments. So just be aware that there are other options out there, but digesting with your whatever protein you extracted with trypsin, kind of the standard step. Okay, 
And so you have your peptide samples from each of your biological samples. So you're ready to TMT label them. Uh, here, I have six samples shown. So I'm gonna use six TMT labels. Um, I'm showing six. Uh, these are now available, commonly sold as either sets of 10 or even now up to 16. Uh, so again, how many labels you use is up to your experiment. Um, and then after you label, you're able to multiplex, which is a fancy way of saying makes all your samples together uh, in equal amounts. Um, so in the next couple of slides, I'll just go in a little bit more in detail about what these TMT labels are. Again, just to help any details that haven't sunk in yet. Okay, so what is a tandem mass tag or TMT label? Like Dr. Wadratna covered, these are isobaric tags. And so here's just kind of a generic schematic of a tag. Um, while over here, I have a set, actual, the sets of 10 that you can buy from Thermo Fisher. And so they have the mass reporter labeled over here. And when you come over to the sets of 10, each of these little red blurry stars is a carbon or a nitrogen isotope. And so while each tag has the same total number of isotopes, the way they're distributed throughout the tag gives this uh, mass reporter region over here a unique mass. So when your samples are in the mass spectrometer and this reporter is cleaved off, as shown here by this cleavable linker, you have a unique mass that will report back relative ion intensity. And so these- Can I, can I make a comment real quick, Caitlin? Yeah, of course. Yeah, what's, what's cool about these is that in that resolution where we have the very high resolution and Orby traps that Dr. Dowd talked about in her lecture on Monday, um, the nice thing about that is that the resolution is so high that the instrument is actually able to tell the difference, uh, measure the difference between a heavy isotope of nitrogen and a heavy isotope of carbon, which is a very small mass difference. And so um, that actually is just something that I think is really cool. And in the tags where they're labeled as N and C, um, that actually is because one is a nitrogen isotope and one is a carbon isotope, which is really cool. So, sorry. Oh no, yeah, that is really cool, the fact that you can tell that. Um, and so each of these tags also has a, they call protein reactive group. Uh, this group reacts with primary means, so it'll label your peptide in termini, which is why we digest before we label, and also lysine residues. And so then after you quench this labeling, so each different biological sample gets one of these labels, and you quench that, and then your samples can be mixed or multiplexed. And so here, I just showed a set of 10, uh, which is up until recently was kind of the main set, but Thermo recently came out with a set of 16 labels that are called TMT Pro reagents. Okay. So you have all your peptides from all your different samples labeled and mixed together. So now you can run them um, on the mass spectrometer. Um, in the next slide, I'm gonna go a little bit more into different mass spec methods that can be used, just brief overviews. Um, but I don't wanna take a second, something I'm not really touching on in detail here, but is a good experimental consideration or a peptide fractionation or separation methods. Um, which are basically ways to decrowd your sample because you combined a lot of different peptides from all kinds of different samples. And so it's a can be a pretty crowded sample. And so you look for ways to decrowd this so that you're not overwhelming the mass spectrometer, and that you have better coverage of all the ions that you um, put in. And so just some common options listed. Uh, one the proteomics core uses quite a bit is high pH reverse phase fractionation. Uh, one that our lab uses uh, and that Dr. Dowd mentioned in her lecture is mud pit or multi-dimensional protein identification technology. Um, and you can play with uh, gradients on the HPLC that's in front of the mass spectrometer. And all of these are either in your sample prep steps or in, in front of the mass spec. Okay. So again, how does, once you're in the mass spec, how does TNT labeling of your samples provide quantitation? 
So here I just have an example uh, spectra. And so again, you have M over Z and you have ion intensity for your Y axis over here. And if we zoom in on this region kind of in between 100 and 200 M over Z, as shown in this little blow up over here, these are where the TMT reporter ions come in. And so you can see I have a set of six that are the set of six over here labeled. And so they're the tag name, whether it's 126, NC through 130, that relates to the M over Z that you get for the unique reporter tag. So that's why they're named that way. And so looking at the general schematic here, you can see when we fragment in the mass spectrometer with nitrogen gas, which is also called HGD or higher energy collision dissociation, which again, Dr. Dowd mentioned in her earlier lecture, this mass reporter cleaves off, which gives you uh, these reporter ion signals over here. And so I just color coded it so that you could see what tag each. And I'll just from. I'll mention here that you can see very clearly the intensity label on the y axis again. So yeah. you can see that it's not a count, it's actually a measure of ion intensity. And so, yeah, you have your relative ion abundance measurement through these reporter ions, and then you also get peptide sequence information. Okay. Um, and so kind of going back to cartoon spectra, like the one I showed here, that's what you get for an MS2 method. So you have your precursor ions in your first MS step. There's no fragmentation for your first MS step. And then you do the HTD fragmentation, which is the specific type of fragmentation that will break off the reporter ions. And so you have those uh, kind of lower down on the M over Z. And then that type of fragmentation will also break um, apart your peptide, and so that's how you get your peptide sequence information. Uh, now you can do multiple mass spec rounds, and so another option is to do an MS3 method, which I have a schematic for here, where again you start MS1, no fragmentation, but your first fragmentation step, instead of doing HCD, which breaks off the reporter ions, you do CID, which is um, with helium instead of nitrogen, it's lower energy, and so you actually don't break off your TMT reporter ions yet. You get, um, you'll break the peptides. Um, and so you get your BNY ion frag fragment ions. And then you select one of those fragment ions or one population of those to then subject to HCD fragmentation and break off your TMT reporter ion. So one reason you would do this is like Dr. Dowd talked about for this MS1 to MS2 step, um, or for MS2, you're selecting a population for fragmentation. So you have that isolation window. And with that window, you're never gonna probably select just the ion you want. And so you have some background that can complicate your uh, quantitation. And so by adding in another selection step, you kind of weed out some of that extra background to get better quantitation with lower background. However, that does limit your sensitivity because you're missing a lot of other ions you might be interested in. So a compromise, what method? Not a compromise, um, an optimized MS3 method is called multi-notch or uh, SPS MS3 methods. And so here you first start with CID fragmentation. So you get your BNY ions, but you're not breaking off your label yet. But instead of just selecting one fragment ion, you're selecting multiple um, through something called synchronous precursor selection. And so while you're still undergoing another round of selection and weeding out some of the little background ions here, you're still selecting more than one intense ion and it'll give you a little more sensitivity while still better quantitation than MS2 when you're not weeding out as much of the background. I mean, that's just kind of shown here, where MS2 has the best sensitivity, where MS3 has the best quantitation accuracy. Okay, and so you've done your mass background, which is whatever MS2 or MS3 method you chose. Uh, so now, how to analyze the data that comes out. Caitlin. That it, uh -huh. Caitlin. 
there's a question. So okay. how, it, the question is, how does the mass spec select a particular fragment ion for the MS3 step? So I believe it's usually uh, kind of intensity, whether it's it selects one of the more intense ions. Yeah, um, so it, it does try to, to do that. And in the SPS MS3, it tries to predict what the most intense ions are going to be. But this is all done in the mass spectrometer in real time. And so this means um, um, this means that it's, it's got to be done really quickly. And so this is one of the areas of development in, um, in the software for the mass spectrometers. So within the instruments um, is to try to keep improving this. And, and we actually in the proteomics core just got a new instrument um, that's supposed to have some new functionalities in this to try to improve that prediction. And so that is a, a really important um, thing because at, in the meantime, you know, it's, it's basically making educated guesses in different ways, uh, but, but it is usually intensity based like uh, what Caitlin had said. And then Sarah um, uh, had just asked if, what do you mean when you say you can do multiple rounds of mass spec? Um, are you using the same sample? Yes, you're using the same sample. So what I mean by multiple rounds is, so, so your ions enter the mass spec um, and you have rounds of detection because you're seeing M over Z, but then you can take that same ion population and you can choose what you're gonna fragment. So like we have um, precursors and then you select a population of those to fragment for MS2 and then you select another population of those to fragment again. So this, these are all in the same mass spec overall run but you're doing multiple rounds of detection yeah, and i'll give a little bit more detail here so in a in a um, chromatography separation on the mass spec your peptide is actually going to elute over a time range that on average is maybe 10 to 30 seconds and the scans are done in milliseconds and so these are all millisecond time scales so because of that, you can do an MS1 scan, identify your precursor, and then you can do the MS2 scan to break it initially, and then an MS to the third scan, all within that 10 to 30 seconds when that peptide is eluding from the, the column. And so it's partially that we make, um, make, make or take advantage of the fact that the mass spectrometer is faster than the chromatography. So I know that that's kind of a, a little bit of a, of a um, maybe jargony heavy thing. Does that, does that make sense, Sarah? Do you, yeah, okay, all right. So, it's, it's, so we, make, make, uh, make, we take advantage of how fast the mass spec is. So I think we're good, Caitlin. Okay, okay. Um, so for data analysis, uh, it, we're down to five five minutes if you're yeah i just have a couple more slides um yeah so we use proteome discover there are other options say max quant is open source um so if you would like to get any try any of this yourself um without purchasing anything so as far as what your output looks like after you've searched your data like dr dowd talked about um to identify your proteins um here's just kind of like a Excel screenshot of a very similar table that you would get. And so with protein description, uh, gene name, and then the important kind of meat of this is you have your PSMs, which are your peptide spectral matches, which you could equate to somewhere as being a read count for how many times you saw a peptide belonging to that protein. And then because TMT labeling gives you abundance values, you have your grouped abundances for your control versus your experimental group. And then you also get an abundance ratio. So in this case, it's uh, the ratio of the abundance for your experimental group of your control, as well as a p-value, and then an adjusted p-value, um, which has gone a more stringent correction. And so great ways to sort this, or you can sort by abundance ratios to see what things, what proteins are changing the most between your two experimental conditions and how statistically significant those changes are.